Hello and uh, welcome to this Horizon Scanning uh, webinar uh, for in-house legal for 2023, uh, running conjunction between Hayes and uh, Field Seymour Parks. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. Um, just by way of some brief introductions, um, my name is Ian McRae and I head up the business services uh, team at Field Seymour Parks. Um, and for those of you who don't know us, we are a full service firm uh, in the Thames Valley and um, indeed do a lot of work with sort of in-house counsel, um, often doing lots of secondments and flexi secondments and things of that nature. But I am pleased to say I'm not here on my own and um, I've got two great uh, panelists as well. So um, I'm joined by uh, Evelyn Stiles from uh, Hayes, uh, who's uh, general counsel uh, there, um, and also uh, Laura Law, uh, who's uh, group head of legal at uh, Wireless Logic. And uh, by way of sort of introduction to them both, uh, Evelyn is uh, responsible for managing the UK and Ireland legal team at uh, Hayes. And uh, prior to joining there, um, she had uh, extensive experience uh, advising companies on corporate, commercial and employment matters, um, both in-house and in private practice. And uh, Laura uh, is a commercial lawyer, uh, had experience at a number of different organisations, uh, including sort of large corporates such as Vodafone, uh, John Lewis and Debenhams, so a few different sectors there. Um, and she's also the co-founder of NAUS, which is an uh, in-house uh, networking group, um, sort of networking and uh, forum for in-house lawyers. Um, so all the contact details for Hayes and Laura will sort of also all be on the uh, end of the session. Um, so thank you both for attending with me. Um, and just to let you all know how the sort of the, the session will pan out today, um, we're due, uh, we've got an hour, um, and we the majority of the session will take the form of a sort of panel discussion, um, but we'll leave some time for sort of questions at the end. Um, you will all be on mute, I'm afraid, so we can't hear you, um, but if you do have any questions, I would encourage you and please do stick them in the uh, in the chat box. You can sort of um, you can either sort of publicize your questions to everyone or you can send them just to ourselves and I'll try and pick those up as we go along. And if I can, I'll um, I'll deal with them as we go. But if not, I'll um, I'll try and pick them up at the end and um, pass your questions on to Evelyn and Laura. Um, uh, there will be a sort of briefing note that will be circulated at the end, summarizing the uh, the main topics of, of discussion that we've covered. And that will also have all the different contact details on there as well um, and um, the sessions being recorded as well so um, a copy of that will be sent to all attendees as well so uh, rather helpfully you can see on the screen what we will um, look to sort of cover today we'll take the form of a, a general discussion so we'll um, it, it, it may be relatively organic in terms of um, how we cover these topics, but we'll look around um, some of the corporate obligations around reporting, um, data protection type issues, the general changing uh, and ever more challenging sort of compliance landscape. Um, talk about diversity as well, um, and then the general challenges of, of being in-house, of managing workload and, um, and dealing with sort of key uh, stakeholders as well um, and the idea of the session is we'll sort of introduce some of these topics and um, uh, and Evelyn and Laura will hopefully share their expertise and uh, what's their sort of current priorities and things that they're looking at at the, at the moment. So if we start off uh, welcome Evelyn and Laura um, and Laura I wondered if we um, start with you really and just sort of I was going to ask you just sort of what sort of changes you've seen to sort of the risk and sort of compliance sort of landscape and requirements over the last sort of few years and, and how that's sort of been impacting on you. Yeah, that's a fun question to start with. Um, oh, no. Let's start with, start with the fun stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so I obviously, like you said, have been in various different industries, so in telecoms and retail and um, now back in sort of the telecoms uh, technology side of the world. Um, so from my own personal experience, I've had to learn different regulatory landscapes. So retail was very much consumer focused, everything to do with how to protect our consumers are. Um, my current position is B2B, so it's much more um, how you run the business. So things like getting the right licenses in place and making sure the right processes are there uh, is more my focus now. Um, we're in 20 different jurisdictions, so we buy a lot of companies. Uh, and so every I turn up on a Monday and we're suddenly in um, 
you know, Singapore. Uh, so my personal landscape ch changes pretty much on a sometimes month by month basis. Um, and with the type of law that I do, it ends up being very much within the country. So whilst we still have the EU laws, I mean, the UK obviously is now uh, Brexited, um, so there's a slight difference there, but actually what you'll find with a lot of regulations that I deal with are that they are per country because the Ofcom equivalents in Germany and France and all those countries are the ones that actually implement the practical side of things. So you could have a threshold that's 10 employees or less in the UK and then in Germany it's a 50 million pound turnover threshold so all very different practical implementations um, how the landscape's changed from my point of view is I think there are more and more sort of things like G you know you remember back to when we did GDPR and there were whole projects because there were these new things putting in place I think ESG is very interesting and feels a bit GDPR-y on the in terms of how we're going to have to implement and get people on board with new processes and new reporting requirements. Um, and then you've got, so you've got a lot of the ESG side of things is, is massive. Then you've got a lot of these national um, security uh, bills coming in. So things mm -hmm. where you're not, you know, foreign investment is starting to have to be look at, looked at and you're getting licenses and approvals for those. And I think, to be honest, it's more of the same. What I'm saying to all of the group is, if you kind of see some things on the horizon in the EU, assume that they will come some form into the UK and assume that it's kind of the general feeling in the in the world. So things like the privacy of changes and uh, you can generally see them across uh, the rest of the world. Um, some are faster than others. So yeah, I think actually if I'm quite enjoying that my job becomes a bit quasi-legal in terms of just making sure the processes and policies are in place because I feel it's a bit more commercial. You feel like you're actually in the business because you have to check what people are doing um, rather than it being very pure legal uh, mm. implementation. So I don't know, Evelyn, if you found the same sort of thing. Oh, oh Evelyn, we can't hear you at the minute. <clears throat> yes, um, I agree, Laura. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Quite similar, actually. You not hear me, right? Let oh, we me can now. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Can you hear me? Good, good, good. Excellent, excellent. Yes, Laura. I think it's quite similar. And Hayes, we're a large global uh, recruitment business. We've got thirteen thousand employees globally, um, and we're in thirty-three countries. Um, so my role, although UK and Ireland, I get involved in quite a lot of the global matters as well. And the risk has shifted with GDPR, as Laura has mentioned. Um, the pandemic, which we all went through and having to ensure that we're not just using our legal hat, but looking at policies and how we operate as a business. Um, I believe that there's a greater emphasis at the moment as well around business continuity plans, disaster recovery, mm -hmm. and just making sure that we've got policies and procedures in place to assist mm -hmm. us and make sure we've got continuity um, of service. So system failure, for example, would be would be a huge impact for us. And I imagine for you, Laura, as well. And we, we are relying more and more on technology like everybody else. Pandemic being a great example, 100% of staff working remotely, that's 13,000. And in the UK alone, we supply 25,000 temps as well to various clients. So again, ensuring that they, the ones who could work remotely, um, continue to do so and have the systems to be able to do it. Um, Cyber security th threats, again, I think that's something that's increased over the years. So we've seen an increase in um, phishing attacks, social engineering and malice codes um, being reported. Um, and then lastly, and I think this is probably more recent that we all keep on talking about, is the high inflation rate, which has impacted many companies. Um, and in the UK alone, as we're all aware, in 40 years, the UK seen its highest inflation rate, 10.4% um, as of February 2023. And that has an impact on um, retention of staff. So what we're seeing is we're closely monitoring that as a recruitment business for our own staff, but externally for our clients as well, to make sure that from a pay perspective, we are retaining the absolute best, best of staff. Oh, great. Yeah, and you're right, and I was, Evelyn, I was gonna say ransom, 
we did a ransomware exercise, for example, and I went on a governance yeah. forum last week and everyone in the room is, that's one of their top scary uh, things. Um, yes. And like I said, it is about the processes though, because in the ransomware exercise, we realized that no one had a phone list of everybody. Um, so, yes. uh, but it was on the system that could, we had got hacked. Um, so it's all purely little things like that just seem to be lost. Um, and it's only yes. when you sort of tread through it that you kind of see things, but they're interesting exercises. Well. They are indeed. And ESG, of course, cannot forget ESG. Yeah. How much would you say, in, in, in terms of obviously a variety of different areas there, some probably sort of business driven, some maybe client or customer driven in terms of expectations, and obviously there's the, sort of the, the legal underpinnings as well. What's What are the main drivers in, in these sort of compliance requirements where what where, where is it coming from in terms of the these areas that you're looking at <clears throat> um Evelyn maybe we we'll start with you <clears throat> okay. all right yeah um I think at the moment in terms of um how it's impacted my role um it's not necessarily just looking at the legal side it's advising on on the business and the commercial and considering ethical matters as well so whether a business decision may um, represent a potential long lasting um, risk to the viability of the business is something we have to think and whether we're doing the right thing. And a great example has been for us, um, we, we had an office in, in Russia and as a result of um, the Ukraine invasion, we had to make that decision of closing down our Russian business and we felt ethically it was the right thing to do. Um, but also getting involved in various policies and initiatives. So for us, looking at progressing from a carbon neutral to a net zero, being involved in those discussions, reducing air travel at the moment to promote more technology and virtual meetings, and then getting involved more in the charity events um, and discussing at board level in terms of which charities we, we should be involved in. So from a UK perspective, we're supporting NGN the um, support and youth homelessness um, and then um, furthermore sort of the recruitment of staff to, to deal with ESG. Um, in the past we probably wouldn't have imagined having to recruit somebody to look at specifically as a project on ESG but that's something that we, we've been involved in as well and, and I've been heavily involved in the discussions. Um, and then I think following on from there as, as, as not being seen as just a lawyer a business advisor, business leader, um, a risk officer, a trusted advisor. There's all these words which floats around. But I think our, our role has definitely changed that although we work house in house and we're lawyers, um, we are seen very much as the business advisor from a legal perspective. So using our legal hat, but also having that commercial um, angle as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that in terms of the business. That, yeah. <clears throat> yeah it, it, they don't want to know the, the legal in-depth stuff, but they do want to know what they should, you know, what they should be focusing on and stuff like that. So when I first joined, this is a startup company. Um, it's not anymore. Well, it calls itself that, but it's, it's got 500 employees and we're a unicorn, which I think is um, when you have over a billion pounds uh, in turnover. Um, but so I had to set up a risk committee and actually at the start of it, the CEO really didn't want, he was very much, oh, you're at governance, oh no, because he'd last started the company in his garage, basically. Um, but actually he's loving the risk committee meeting now because what it does is sit everyone around the room and we can have a chat about the actual risk. And he's really interested, for example, in understanding how IT is doing uh, with their risks and how they're backing up systems and things like, exactly like Evelyn pointed out, things to do with how the inflation has impacted our hedging and our effects trading rate and stuff like that. So it's all the people in stakeholders of the business in one room having a kind of a chat um, about risk. And it's 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 making it realistic to the business and making it valuable to the business itself. I think was the way I got him so interested in it, the meeting's overrun now, <laughs> um, for example. Um, and in terms of pressure, I kind of, we're in the middle like this. So we have private equity owners um, and they very much, certainly on the ESG side of things, are wanting us to focus, to look at that and set, they set sort of their expectations from a reporting point of view in terms of how we're doing that. And then you do get customers asking, I mean, more and more, depends on which, like French customers, for example, very sophisticated uh, users of ESG um, in terms of they're asking for 
um, what our score is in, in whenever RFPs. And it's trying to get everyone on board with sort of having the, those that score available because France is doing it in their country, but we're not doing it here. So should we get one group level one? So I think, as you say, like we get the pressure both sides um, and then it's doing what we need to do to kind of address both of those questions, which are very different because one's reporting, one's a customer wanting to know numbers. Um, so yeah. I think it's, it's quite interesting being in the middle, <laughs> if a bit. It is. And Laura, I think a great example actually is when you've got a live disaster, which shouldn't happen. So I think for, for me, from my perspective, the one that I always try and quote around um, risk is around competition law. And unfortunately, many years ago, we were fined um, 33 million pounds for breach of competition law, but we got that reduced to 5 million. And as a result of that, we've got this whole annual training on um competition law compliance every year but as a, as unfortunate as it was it's such a great example to say actually when you get things wrong this is what can happen it's true you do need so the reason we did the ransomware event was we had a very minor sort of uh, basically into someone's email account they sent a phishing email someone clicked on the link and it meant they had access so they they uh, they were spoofing, well, they were actually sending emails from our CFO of one of our um, acquisitions to our finance director. So he, it was it was the right email address. So all of the training you can give people um, on how to spot a kind of a fake email, that wasn't the case. But what has come out of that was, it's exactly the same. It's a great example to the business of why we need to have some things in place. And it's, it's as much as it's painful at the time, it's valuable to be able to drive the behavior forward um, in the business by saying, well, you remember, though, so you remember what happened. Um, and it gets them on board a little bit easier, I think. Not that you want that to happen, but it's easier when it happens. No. <laughs> it's interesting because I did wonder if you if you were both sort of going to say that, that dealing with sort of a, a sort of an increased sort of compliance workload was making it more difficult to sort of be integrated into the business and give that business advice and keep stakeholders happy but from what it sounds like from from both of you actually it's it's been it's an opportunity to actually engage and look and stuff at a, at a practical level yeah yeah because a lot of the process you end up putting in place needs buy-in from the people who are going to do it so it means you have to have the conversations with them about why they're being asked to do things um and like for example we're doing a on, you know, we bought buy new by companies. So I've now put in place like a day one readiness. Um, and we got it all beautifully done by marketing and it was all lovely and snazzy. And then I wrote the covering email, which I mean, it was legal because um, I'm not marketing. And it, that kind of felt, it, it ruined the whole message because it basically then felt like a very um, legal email on what was day one after everyone's exhausted having done an acquisition and just wants to get to the champagne. And then they get an email from me going, hi, policies. Um, so, you know, all these things are little tried and tested just to work out how to do them. Because now I'm gonna go away and marketing again and we'll work out how to deliver it better next time. And um, you learn off other businesses as well. I think that's really important in-house to learn off other businesses ridiculously I'm learning off a funeral um, for a company that buys a lot of funeral um, companies and they had a wonderful like welcome pack for any acquisition they made which had all this it felt very friendly and very um, not so legal um, and so I'm going to talk to that kind of contact I made um, about putting in place our own one because I thought that was a great idea so definitely borrow um good ideas from people who've gone through it and have done the testing if you, you've got any tips for people in terms of getting that sort of stakeholder engagement on these issues when you haven't had the advantage disadvantage of something going wrong in the past to point to is there, there anything evelyn that you would sort of you use as trying to get that buy-in when you're doing something that people maybe don't quite see the point of <clears throat> yeah i mean for me as i said it being able to provide a great example of why we need it, because it's not just having a policy, the business need to see actually, has this ever occurred? Because they usually say, oh, but it's low risk. Why do we need to do this? This has never occurred before. So when I can provide them with examples of where actually this has occurred and here were the ramifications or potential ramifications, but we're able to provide a solution, that helps them. 
And also I think building a relationship with your stakeholders is absolutely fundamental. Whether it's going for coffee, going for lunch, um, helping them with maybe even a non-legal related query or a personal legal query. Um, query. But I think working in-house, they are colleagues and it's so important to have that relationship. So you're not just seen as the lawyer, the police officer, that you're seen as part and parcel of the business. And if you're able to build that relationship with your stakeholders, you can then manage their expectations uh, and they have visibility of all the challenges that you have. So when there's a key issue, you're able to go to them direct and explain and then try and get that buy in. Yeah, Laura, yeah, anything I agree. you'd add to that? Yeah, <clears throat> oh, okay. I like you want to be there is sometimes it depends on how sophisticated your business is, but very much like oh, the legal department. Um, whereas you want to actually be as approachable as possible so that everything does come through to you. So I think proving yourself by giving pragmatic advice, by being trusted um, and you know, building those relationships, exactly like Evelyn says, is really important because then they do naturally come to you rather than it being sort of a tick box exercise. And I think you want to be embedded a bit more in all of their processes um, just, to, just to sense check sometimes and show we can add loads of value. Um, if they use us properly. Mm. <laughs> yes. So, and, and in terms of sort of managing these in your, your sort of respective current organisations, obviously you've got sort of an increased compliance requirements. Um, you've got, you know, various different initiatives and project, projects you're rolling out. You've got a wish to be in the business, to be approachable to stuff to cope. How, how do you cope with that? workload obviously you've got slightly different organizations between the two of you but but Evelyn maybe starting with you how, how have you managed that is it about building a structure a team how yeah <clears throat> yeah for me very much it's a case of building a structure and a team so when I first joined Hayes many years ago we used to outsource quite quite a lot of things um, and what I ended up doing was bringing some of the matters like employment law some of the general commercial matters bringing them in-house and building a team to be able to assist me with those with those matters um, and then as the workload has increased we still haven't had enough individuals with, within the legal team enough lawyers to assist but then the budget you're always constrained with sort of budgets and it's a case of right you're not going to get any more lawyers because budget's tight so how can you possibly progress so what we started doing or what I propose is that we used allies so we engage with our commercial colleagues to see if they could assist us when we're under resourced by dealing with the low level stuff um, which was subject to training um, and as a result of that we ended up training some of our non-legally qualified colleagues who are not even um, paralegals to to review standard ndas simple contracts um, and this was undertaken by providing them with a spreadsheet frequently asked questions um, a webinar seminar which was recorded which they could then review um, so that all they needed to do was just follow that process and then if they've got any queries they can still come through back to our legal team um, and also engage in external law firms um, just to provide us with regular updates so that we're all equipped with the knowledge to be able to advise the business but but having the sort of the allies, I think, and engaging your own colleagues who are not legally qualified is absolutely essential to manage the workload. Great. Laura, how did slightly like different experience allies. maybe? <laughs> yeah, allies, allies is good, allies. yeah. Like, education is a large, educating the rest of the business is a large um, part of what I'm trying to do, because exactly like you say, Evelyn, is trying to get them to help themselves um, and pointing out, so I'm, there's a team of one at the moment, I'm one, uh, but I'm hopefully getting two trainees and that would be great. Um, but yeah, at the moment it's very much for, you know, the sales section of the business, teaching them what they can say to customers. So saying, okay, these are our standard terms. What are your five top concerns? If they are wanting, don't, not just blindly sending, you know, the word version of our T's and C's and to explain to them why that is, or to show them the delay and the extra work that has to go into it when they just do that um so again we did a whole sales presentation uh, sales training with them that sort of said these are issues if they raise them then actually a lot of these you're empowered to go back on anyway because they're commercial things um or and if they do have issues with the clauses because some companies do have deal breakers you know on 
governance and stuff then give us a list and we can work with the bullet points but try and limit everyone down as much as possible because otherwise it's just a lot of work and we're not resourced for it and then i think evelyn made a good point as well again about setting expectations so on the flip other side i've had to basically put an out of office that says it's a one to two week turnaround right now because it's only me as the resource plan accordingly um and i'm hoping that again is driving behavior um of people not sending me things that are urgent that aren't or just at least planning it in to when they know things are on the horizon um obviously if something is urgent we'll do it but it's just making sure that everyone's kind of if you start out setting the expectation then they can't really be that angry at you when they come to you and want it tomorrow and you said it's about two week turnaround at the moment for general work so yeah it's, it's again it's adapting with what you've got um at Debenhams I had like a team of five and we were all doing work and it was great and whereas here it's sole job so you've got less capacity you have to kind of prioritize um what you do and then it's teaching the business how to use serve themselves before engaging legal really yeah it's interesting it's, it's even when you've sort of got a larger team there's obviously the, it, there are always the budgetary restraints so always yeah. always <laughs> Because I've got a team of nine and there's still always budget constraints. Have you ever had issues, um, either of you sort of in your career, in terms of demonstrating the benefit of, of legal, as we're talking about sort of budgetary issues? Has that been ever an issue, not necessarily in your current roles, but in, in the past in terms of de demonstrating that to the business and it's not just being seen as a, as a, as a cost, as an overhead? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, from my perspective, absolutely. Um, so in terms of presenting into cost savings what i've done is i've i've provided them with an example of if you outsource this to a legal firm this is how much it costs you versus you've got the in-house lawyers so much more cheaper and then um where we've had litigation as well and we've been successful it's the cost savings arising from that or from key co contractual negotiations where if we had agreed it one way, it would have cost us more. We've managed to negotiate it down, it's cost us less. So we sort of give examples, live examples of cost savings to the business and it's been quite effective. Yeah, disputes is a good one because there is actual money involved a lot of the time. There. So it's, it is hard, isn't it, to show value when you're just doing negotiation on contracts in the daily course of things to show that actually having us was a, was a useful thing. Um, but I do, I think you can, you can show kind of value in terms of speed to contracts. So I'm, you know, doing initiatives like I'm trying to do at the moment, which is really reduce the amount of contract documents. So time, call it time to contracts, you know, is quicker because then they get the money in faster. So kind of the value of the legal team is sort of saying, we've made a better process for you um, in doing it. And so I think there's different ways of showing value, but you're right, it's hard when you're tracking objectives, for example, and you get like 100% and lots of people are getting 112% because it's purely, you know, based on financials and you're trying to show a 112% of, of something that you do, you're do, you doing anyway. It's, it is a difficult, I think it's a problem with all the legal uh, profession in, in house that you can't, it's hard to show value um, from a numbers basis. No, absolutely. I was I was going to change tact a little bit there and um, talk a little bit about data protection, um, if that's okay, or data issues. Um, obviously, we are uh, give or take five years on from uh, GDPR. Um, and um, Evelyn, I thought I'd start with you on this. Obviously, data is such a huge part of of your guys' business. <laughs> Um, I just wondered if there were sort of particular things or, or how things have developed over that period in time or, or lessons learned in, in, in terms of how you've, how you've done things since that sort of big bang for a lot of people five years ago. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Um, so for us, the biggest change was that because we are in 33 countries, it was setting up a specialist GDPR working party, as, as we call it, an internal one. And that was gathering all of our legal colleagues globally so that we could have a data protection committee which agrees policies which can apply across all jurisdictions with some minor amendments based on on local legislation that was really important for us because 
the last thing we wanted to do was have a different policy for the UK, a different one for Ireland and the Mexico to have a different one. We felt if we could be as joined up as possible and then take into consideration local legislation, that would really assist and that, that's been great. Um, and then the other thing that we've done is we've changed our annual online data protection training programme. So previously it was just a really short data protection, but as a result of us seeing increasing queries coming through we felt that it was probably quite useful for us to expand the online training and to do so where we're providing a lot more examples um, rather than I think individuals when they sit in that online program they find it quite dull if it's just regurgitating the legislation so being able to provide sort of scenarios of okay what if this happens or you know if you lose this um, they found it with sort of interesting pictures and things like that. We found it um, much more um, embracing. Our privacy policy, we've had to regularly update. Pre-GDPR, I think it was just one policy that was drafted, tucked away, and we never thought about it ever again. But with data protection legislation, because it's constantly evolving and our processes are constantly changing um, yeah. with how we operate. Um, we have to regularly review and update our privacy policy. And actually, the last one was just updated in, in um, on Monday for, for the UK and Ireland business. Like most businesses, I'm sure, we've encouraged a paperless office, which has been much more easier as a result of the pandemic. Um, Pre-pandemic, I think people were finding it quite challenging because it's still very much the old-fashioned way of operating, printing documents and walking across to meeting with large documents. Um, but, but now it's so much easier for us to encourage that paperless um, office. Um, and we've enhanced our IT securities as well as a result of that. Laura, obviously less data heavy as a, as, as a business, but obviously you've got various international, uh, uh, international different jurisdictions. Um, any sort of particular challenges that, that sort of the data protection requirements cause you or your organisation? Yeah, I mean, it is nice to not, so our data really are SIM card numbers that would not make any sense to anyone any, they're all pseudonymous data, it's, um, and it's a welcome change from Debenhams where you're dealing with a lot of customers uh, and their subject access requests yes. and all that jazz and fun stuff. Um, so not so much of that anymore. Um, we have, I think, exactly right, Evelyn says, it's actually more, from my point of view, about educating relevant examples um, in the business so we often have all of our sort of data incidents are things like a user error so someone sent it to the wrong email address um, and all those six things and yeah leaving documents lying around the office or and it's making if you make it relevant to them then I think they're much more engaged rather than watching a system so that from a jurisdiction point of view is one of the kind of due diligences you can do when across all of our portfolio which is to really send them very re reasonable and relevant data uh, kind of training and also contacts if they have any questions and making the whole process very easy user friendly um, so our data incident reporting tool is, is like a really short form on our intranet for example but it comes through to me and it'll it'll ping up and then I can just deal with it um, instead of making them you know fill out anything really cool. um, but you're right it's a challenge everyone the problem is the acquisitions it's always a challenge because everyone's got different uh, kind of how through the scale of how good they are at the GDPR and a lot of the businesses where startups where that they've done like a really minimum level so you've kind of got to put in place that some of them from scratch is actually probably easier than where someone's got kind of a process that's not great but it's in there embedded anyway um, so it get, it's getting them on board to see the value of what you're sending them, that it's not just a training policy and explaining to them why they would need to do what's, you know, the risks of it and why they, you want them to all be compliant with the sort of group policy um, level. But yeah, it, it, and you have to, I suppose, we just bought in the APAC, so they will have, you know, you've moved from GDPR kind of to a whole different level, new range of privacy laws. Um, Evelyn, you're probably dealing with those already, but like, yeah, it's, it's to us, it's sort of upskilling <laughs> um, in that. 
No, great. And, and and Evelyn, I was, and this may be where your sort of your working party comes in, but uh, we've certainly seen a lot where sort of, um, you know, a lot of stuff was introduced five years ago. Um, to a certain extent, it's been kept under review, but but as and when it's you know properly audited, there's a the reality emerges that actually the practices are not matching up with the policies. How, how do you as an organisation try and ensure that people are actually doing what they're meant to be doing and what you say you do? <laughs> yes. So again, it just goes back to the training. So we're always constantly training. Um, we provide our own staff with the ability to be able to contact us about data protection queries. So we've got a separate UK data at Hayes.com, which is an inbox, which is sent through via um, candidates, for example, if candidates have any queries about their um, files and they want to um, actually erase their data or if they've got any questions about it, then they need to go through to this inbox. Internally as well, we've got our own internal inbox where individuals can contact us and we can advise them on any data protection queries. What we've found increasingly is where we feel employees require training, um, we tend to then provide them with bespoke training outside of the online training, which, which I think that's really imperative and, and quite helpful. So it's not only just the annual online training, there may be bespoke um, face-to-face or webinar trainings for certain individuals where we feel that they just need a bit more upskilling. No, great. Well, what about yeah, your sort of experiences? <clears throat> well, like I, I would say probably, yeah, tra the training is the key thing. Um, with as, a, as an in-house lawyer, you're always adapting, aren't you, to whatever business you're in. And so now I'm in a telecoms business that has networks. And so actually had to suddenly set up a process of dealing of, with um, in Investigatory Powers Act one. So that's where the police want all deck call records. Because they're usually invested, it's really, it's quite, it's always quite exciting because it's usually they're invested like arms dealers um, that have got and that and they want access to the data records to help arrest people and or prove evidence. So again, that was done quite ad hoc. So you're putting in place the processes so that again it's easier for people to quickly answer those questions, but you know that they're coming in. And exactly like Evan says, it's training the right people. So only a couple, no, not everyone gets those only a few people, but those people need to know the enhanced extra, you know, dealings with the data or the requests that they will get. Um, and again, it's our kind of our invoicing team are the ones that often send out a lot of things that sometimes end up in user errors. So it's sort of maybe taking them to one side and training them a little bit more than other people in the office that won't use data so much. So I think, yeah, you've learned, what I think we've learned from GDPR is it's not one size fit all, fits all and that it's actually having people internally just doing it as a, a part of their daily work without thinking about it like taking stuff off the photocopier making sure they've checked who they're cc'ing um embedding it that way is is kind of more important than necessarily having doc, good old documents all in place um but yeah it's great i've got um question here which is about the uh the the changes in the current bill so we've got the, the the data protection and digital information number two bill very catchy name um which i think has gone back um for a recent reading i think only within the last week or so and um, the question is really just to what extent either of you are already planning for those changes in that bill or is that it's obviously still quite a way away because we don't have you know the act has yet to be passed there'll be then an implementation period but just wondered to what extent that's already on your radar or is it one for another day <clears throat> yeah so from our perspective it's on our radar because we've engaged external lawyers to advise us on data protection um and we actually went through a summary of it and we determined actually it wouldn't really impact how we provide the services because we will continue to be just as stringent um, even if the UK decide to relax the, the legislation because we are a global organisation. So first reading appears to be fine, but we don't believe we'll be changing anything significantly in terms of how we operate from a UK perspective as a result of us being a global business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've got to keep one eye on not diverging too much across your global, like you don't really, I know the UK might be stepping one side of the 
you know, general EU, but given how many EU entities we have, I would have just said, let's go with the kind of what will end up being like best practice, uh, maybe more stringent uh, measures. But yeah, I wouldn't have thought we would change that much either. Um, yeah, well, probably I'm, quite uh, useful yeah. for some of the consumer stuff I was doing, but. <laughs> <laughs> No, excellent. Um, and then uh, moving on to sort of a, a, a different topic uh, and to pick up on sort of um, diversity and inclusion, um, both in sort of in-house and also, in, I guess, in your organisations as a as a whole. Um, Evelyn, um, maybe starting with you, I just wondered how you sort of felt that in-house legal and in-house teams can sort of help promote diversity in their organizations or their teams is, is there anything in particular you'd highlight <clears throat> um i don't necessarily believe that it should be the in-house legal team's responsibility to help promote diversity in my view diversity should be applied to everybody within that organization and everyone has a responsibility to make sure that they promote that um, so it shouldn't just fall on the legal team from, from my perspective, diversity means looking and reviewing the data that you've got within the organisation. Um, and once you've got that data, I guess the most difficult part actually is encouraging individuals to, for example, to complete the Equal Opportunities Monitoring form, for example. Um, and what I've found in the past is if you can encourage the employees to complete it by providing examples of where we've had a great outcome, as a result of completion of, of that data that, that that's always been quite quite helpful so um, from my perspective it's looking at that data and being able to have role models within the organization so i'm old enough to to know that when i was applying for jobs i definitely wasn't looking for for roles on the basis that individuals somebody looked like me i just applied for a job because i needed a job and that was it um, but I completely appreciate that the new generation coming in, their expectation is that when they are applying for jobs, they want to see individuals who look more like them, or if they're female, see a woman in more of a senior position. Um, so promoting that diversity within that organisation isn't necessarily just having the policies in place, mm -hmm. but actually being able to show, have visibility of, of that diverse. Um, and diversity doesn't just, in my view, uh, limit it just to an individual's race or their sex or whether they've got a disability. It's also their social background, you know, and, and having different people from different backgrounds within a department. And, and my legal department is great because we've got individuals, you know, from all different backgrounds. Um, it's a great way of sharing ideas sharing knowledge because individuals can come back with different ideas rather than engaging individuals from the same background who have exactly the same idea um, doesn't change anything. Um, one other thing actually that we've done within our organisation is to provide training on con unconscious bias training yeah. and if you're able to do that for bespoke individuals particularly line managers that's so important because one thing that you could say to one individual you may not pursue it as being offensive. However, another individual may do. And it's just having that training just to be aware um, that, that you know, you've got to be really careful in terms of how, how you um, say things. And then developing networks. So um, for us within Hayes, we've developed organically quite a few networks to give employees the voice to, to be able to communicate and come up with ideas of how we can um, we can promote things and, and do things much better. So in the UK, we've got the Pride Network, um, we've got the Black Employees Network, Parents at Work, Menopause Group, um, various, which has all been built by the employees in order for them to just share knowledge, best practices um, within the organisation. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's doing what you can with what you've got as well in terms of in-house legal. I mean, we can we can stress on the ESG sort of side of things about we have to report with numbers and everything like that. We're actually quite diverse. We've got quite a, long, a lot of young people, so we're quite diverse in the junior ranks. But yeah, we've got, you know, white male board. Um, so there is definitely work to be done. And it's, it's doing things like I was literally on a course yesterday about women in leadership. And they have, for example, I didn't 
well, there's so many resources out there. There's one which can check a job uh, uh, application form for gendered language. So just you've written a sort of a you know job role description, and actually it'll go through and say, well, you, how this reads it to one person might be different to you know might actually exclude some people you don't want to be excluding. So it's all these sort of little bits that you can kind of change to make it generally drive the change. Um, things like I know a colleague of mine used to insist, um, we don't have panel firms, but every one of the panel firms had to provide a diverse panel. So they didn't want four white males turning up to do the presentation. They were quite specific in a kind of, in a way that said, you on your panel that represents us, you need to try and make it as diverse as possible. Um, and yeah, like things like showing people recruiting where you can, uh, kind of with one eye on it, um, being the being the representative in when you get to a senior kind of legal point of view, you are a senior member of the company, and just showing exactly like you say, Evelyn, like kind of someone that looks maybe like them, so they can aim for it. Um, yeah, I think I think it's all it's all these little bits you can just do with just to keep a little bit of a more of a mind on it, an active mind on it, and things like the unconscious bias training would be brilliant because a lot of people don't realise um, that they have those biases until it's kind of pointed out to them. Have either of you, um, either of your sort of current organisations or, or or previous ones? Um, uh, either placed obligations on external law firms or sought to find out more about their approach to sort of diversity and inclusion before instructing them, whether it's panel, informally, formally. Is, is that something either of you have come across before? We've seen it on, a, on occasions on the other end of it. <clears throat> like I say, I've seen it done. Um, I, was, no, we haven't, I haven't been in a place to do it yet because no. the panels were always there, but it was a very interesting thing. I think it was so Vodafone very hot on that kind of stuff and that's when I was there. They were sort of saying we don't want the panel to turn up and it to be not diverse at all. So again, it's it's trying to drive their behaviour so that they don't send out that same person for all the things that they do have to think about it themselves. Um, obviously, kind of you can't make <laughs> you've got to work with what they've got as well. <laughs> they don't have any diverse lawyers, and well, they've got to think about that. Evelyn, what, what about you? Have you had any experience of that? Or? No, I mean, I've heard about it, but I haven't had any experience because similar to Laura, we've got an existing um, panel list. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's a good point, actually, in terms of moving forward to, to consider that. I think um, the, the, the rationale we've had for it when we've sort of been asked about it has been um, not only about trying to ensure that you know suppliers, the organisation are, are you know are promoting diversity and inclusion in their own workforce, but but also particularly with in-house legal, that obviously the route in-house legal often comes from private practice. So people you know start in private practice and move out. So it's it, you know if 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 there is a lack of diversity in private practice, there is a risk that that spins into a lack of diversity in in in-house roles in in future. And I know some people come come straight into in house, but um, but yeah, it's um it's sort of an interesting area, and sort of we've been asked sort of different things by sort of different organisations, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's good. I mean, my two train. I'm able to offer this training contract, which is great to do. Kind of, I really pushed for it because, like, you know, there are loads of people out there who want to do a training contract, and I there are so many of the CVs that I get in, and they're just paralegal, 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 because they've not been able to get into a law firm to do. That example because there's only limited amounts of space the more i think in-house council sort of um push to get trainees straight into that straight in it gives another route and certainly on the social mobility side there then kind of talked about it was yes. how, that it's really helpful because these you know mm. that is the way in my my intake at law firm was all oxbridge pretty much apart from a couple of mm. other you know and red brick so um i'd much rather have a bit more of a diverse people and just people online it is very easy to be a training provider um, as an in-house lawyer because certainly with the SQE stuff now it's made it a lot more easy easy internally to do it but I was doing it when it was training contract so it's not I know it seems like it might be something that's very hard to, to do but actually it wasn't that much to get the authorization and to just put in place and with the work we do they have a full seat I mean they don't end up having to do corporate commercial because they just do they do Monday and they've pretty much ticked their seat off uh, all of the seats off 
So yeah, I would encourage it because it is another route for people that aren't, they clearly want to train to be a lawyer, but it's the route in. Evelyn, in terms of that sort of side of it, if, if you ever sort of brought in sort of trainees or, or, or apprentices into legal? <clears throat> yes, um, qu quite frequently actually. So, um, and usually individuals have come through either from the paralegal or the contracts advisor route. Um, and my proudest moment actually is, is having one individual who I spotted working as a receptionist, actually she had a law degree to work in receptionist, I had huge litigation that I required assistance on. She started working for me um, in the legal department. She trained as a paralegal, legal exec. Um, she then qualified as a lawyer and she's still with me now as, as one of my, my senior lawyers, um, which, which is just absolutely great. And then I've had others who've um, trained, qualified, and then they've gone on. One of them now is, I think they're the head of legal for, for one of the professional services company. So I really quite enjoy developing um, my team when the opportunity arises for, for, for people that are non-qualified. Um, and equally, I also have individuals who've gone down the normal routes of, you know, training at the, the Russell groups, um, yeah. as well as, you know, at law firms and, and then transitioning so it's quite a mix in my team which i really like yeah, fantastic i'm conscious of time and I've, I've got some some questions um from some of the attendees anyone else has any others do stick them in the in the chat box and i will um i'll try and pick them up but um um some particular ones to to pick up um oh here's a good one so uh, what one piece of advice would you give to a junior in-house lawyer it's quite broad but um, Laura, words of wisdom? I think be, be prepared to deal with everybody because um, that's the thing. So the business won't see you as, they'll just see you as a lawyer, right? You're just a lawyer. Um, and they and there are varying degrees of sophistication of how people can use lawyers in, in the business. But um, I think it's really good training to be able to give advice to very junior people, to, but then also to then have to same day give advice to senior stakeholders. And I think you will get a lot of that when you're in house. Um, so not to be not to be too scared of doing that, because I think that's how you get um, really good experience uh, in dealing with lots of different types of stakeholders and that will carry you through um, and people will need different types of advice. So the junior person might need more just actually trying to educate them and trying to teach them how to use legal, whereas the senior one might just need a real quick answer. They always want quick answers uh, when they're senior um, on something that you know you might need to again manage their expectations about when you can get back to them because it might be something that you need to look at. So yeah, um, I'd say get get jump both feet in in terms of who you're dealing with and don't be too worried about because everyone just sees you as a lawyer. So um, use that to your benefit. Okay. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Laura. And, and one of the other things flowing on from that is um, you move away from the legal jargon. So they don't necessarily business don't necessarily want to hear you quoting the law. They want you to be solutions driven. So where you're given a difficult task, go away and think about it. You don't need to provide them with a response straight away, even though in some instances you may have an individual just approach your desk and say, can I have an answer now? You don't need to answer it straight away and go away, research and then try and come up with solutions. Because when you work in house, it's very much being a solutions driven, not just quoting the law and, and finding other ways to say no, but saying it in the nicest possible way. So that legal, you're not just seen as the, the blocker um, and that you're saying, OK, maybe this quite won't work, but here's a solution. Here's something else which may work for you. No, brilliant. Um, and I've, I've got another question here, which is a uh, completely different tact, um, but asking about um, the uh, planned new corporate offence for failing to prevent fraud. Um, so um, for those of you who haven't, haven't seen this or uh, not aware of it, obviously that is something that's, that's planned to be brought in, similar to sort of the anti-bribery, um, mm -hmm. that same sort of thing with sort of the, the, the reasonable procedures type defence. I think we've got a while for this one. Um, last I heard was maybe sort of end of, of 2024, so a little while. Is is that something either of you have started to 
think about at all? Laura, maybe starting with you. <laughs> it was, so would you, there's current sort of the criminal, I don't know the full word of it, but the tax evasion that you need to put in place. And yeah. we as a business, we use a lot of consultants and contractors and stuff like that. So you've got to keep a little bit of an eye on it because, um, but what I found again, it's, it's not a, it's a quasi legal thing that you need to work on putting in place. So I put in with HR, here's a little, here's a sense check form you, you check off. And if to just make sure that that person isn't, um, you're not just employing them as a consultant to avoid tax, you know, so you've just, it's their very um, business questions. So do they have their own email address? Do they use the office email address? How often do they work for us? Do they work from home. Um, so sense check and then it's all about due diligence, exactly like you said, in like defences. So it's getting that sort of process in place with the buy-in from the right part of the business um, so that you've at least ticked you know, the boxes that you need to, to have something on record. Um, and then you need to work on how to embed it and make it part of the culture. Um, so those, all those sort of things like anti-bribery and tax evasion and fraud um, are pros about processes, which is a, a quite an in-house thing to do, I think, which is, is nice because you do end up working with all the business to get it in place. Yes, yeah. Evelyn, what about yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Laura. I don't think I've got anything to add other than you you would work with all the different departments, HR, tax, your business lead, um, to make sure you've got a policy in place. And then part of that, we would then roll it out as an annual um, online training. Yeah. I think you, there's, there's obviously it's been a bit of a sort of theme as we've sort of been chatting things through in that in that some of these sort of requirements, um, whether they're sort of legal or, or compliance or business requirements, they're all potentially an opportunity for you to engage with different bits of the business, um, which is um, obviously crucial to sort of getting that buy-in. Um, I think that's all the all the questions I've got. So I think that just leaves me to say thank you so much to Laura and uh, Evelyn for your time. It's been really interesting to hear sort of about your, your different experiences in your business. Um, obviously, the, the contact details are on that slide there. So um, if you uh, have any needs on sort of the, the recruitment side or anything like that, then uh, Yvonne's details are on there. Please do get in touch with uh, her at Hayes. Uh, Laura is on there from uh, Field Seymour Parks, who's our uh, head of client services. And also at Checkout Now because uh, they won some uh, great uh, in-house networking events um, and uh, you can find them on there so the LinkedIn page but um, otherwise I will leave it there uh, thank you very much to everyone for attending and um, yeah um, uh, thank you once again to Evelyn and Laura thank you everyone bye bye yeah and thank you thank you very much yeah, thank you thank you bye bye thank you Ian. Bye.